Three, two, one. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and berries. <laughs> Welcome to the Magic Brad Show, and uh, this is a new program we're just getting going, and uh, it's all about uh, magic, and magic is a very interesting thing in this world, and I'm meeting a lot of other magicians from all over the world, and um, I've got a new friend, his name is Jan, John, and the last name I believe is pronounced Miesener. Did I get that right, John? You got it. Exactly. Ah, yay. Yay. Well, this is kind of fun. Um, Magic is an interesting business. I've been doing it since I was four or five years old. I'm 63 now, but um, I did it full time through the 70s and 80s and 90s. And I just found that it kind of makes a person's brain develop differently <laughs> than uh, normal people, don't you think? I agree. Yeah, we never grow up. That's, that's how, it's, how it's different. There's that, but there's also the fact that um, with music, it's kind of all they're out there. You see their fingers moving, you hear the music happening. With magic, you see the ball go from one hand to the other and then it's gone. You didn't see all the stuff that the work, you didn't see the work. You just right. saw it like a natural thing happening. Exactly. I've, and oddly enough, uh, I do school shows quite often, not as much as I used to, uh, partly because of COVID. And what happens, the schools went to art quote unquote, arts. Mm -hmm. And I've been told by teachers, magic is not an art. Uh, they, they feel that magic is just a trick. Uh, they don't realize the actual technical ability behind that, the choreography, the music, much more. Uh, one of the biggest sayings in magic, we make the impossible look easy and the easy impossible. Exactly. And, and so I'm... that's what happens is uh, we make it look so well that you know, people go, oh, it's just a trick, but they don't realize the hours of rehearsal behind it or taking care of the animals. I have animals in my show, so they don't realize the time with the birds and the dog in the show, taking care of that behind the scenes. Uh, yeah, they, yeah, I had a lot of teachers say that this is not an art, so we can't have it in our school. That's, it, that's interesting, because that you're talking about the businessy element of it, all the, the right, work yeah. that goes into it, but yeah. there's also the element of I mean, it's an art to make it look like you're doing one thing and your brain is actually thinking about all the other stuff that's really going on mm -hmm. and the people around you and things. I think it's definitely an art. And uh, you, you oh, see someone that's, that's playing the piano and all the work that they put into and they make it look like it's effortless. Mm -hmm. They don't realize how many hours we spend practicing and then it seems like a trick. I, I don't even like calling it a trick because we're not trying to trick we're just trying to expand the imagination into this something that's possibly possible. Was well, Prescott said an effect, not a trick. I, I believe you it's know. more of an effect and, uh, or a miracle or a, an illusion or a perception, but a trick, it makes you feel like you're a con man or a- You're right, you know, snake, snake oil salmon. Yeah, or it's like uh, you ever walking down the hallway and someone taps you on the shoulder and you look in the- Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> that's a trick. Ding dong ditch. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but um, yeah, with music, you can actually see, I mean, uh, the late Eddie Van Halen, who just died a couple months ago, you can actually see his fingers move and you look and go, how does his fingers move like that and make those sounds? Right. Uh, with magic, even though they can kind of see our fingers moving with cards or with balls or cigarettes or thimbles or what have you, it, they don't realize that it is, it is a learned and practiced part of magic. It just looks like, oh, they could just go and do it. Whereas they look at Eddie and go, oh my gosh, no one could do that. Which no one could. Eddie was in his own class. Well, but, exactly. Um, yeah, like exactly. I said, we just make the easy look impossible and the impossible look easy. So they don't appreciate what goes on behind the scenes because they really can't see us hitting those keyboards. Or and what's, on the, on what's the, also interesting about it is we can't tell them and explain how much work goes into it. That's right. Yep. And that's sort of a pet peeve of mine that I've got going on. You might have saw it on some of the groups of people exposing the magic and it's gotten rampant with YouTube and TikTok and people doing it for the views and all that. And I've seen yeah. seasoned professionals that are all of a sudden exposing illusions just for a little joke. Right. You know, i be honest with you. I, I go on a different direction on that a little bit. You know, a couple things. When the mass magician was on Valentino, when we found out it was Valentino, Honestly, my shows popped. I, I did even more shows because people saw that and they go, oh, we're going to catch him. And all the stuff, you know, yes, he gave a couple things away, but most of it to me was air. It just mm -hmm. looked good. And they hire me and they go, oh, how did he do that? You know, because first of all, you have to have the people that actually watch the program. You have to have the people that actually YouTube the trick, then remember what they saw 
And then remember, if we did it exactly the same as YouTube, you know, everybody does it a little differently, mm -hmm. uh, like metamorphosis. You know, some have, I don't know if we can talk about how tricks are done on this program, but some have different ways of doing metamorphosis. And I agree. do it a different way than what Valentino showed. They're like, oh, okay, we don't know. So I, I agree. have a little bit different views. If people are that, that uh, ambitious to go and find out how a trick was done, hey, good for them. But you know what? In the end, I still entertain them, and that's why they hired me. So there's definitely that, but yeah. um, I still go the other way of the essence of it. It's almost like giving someone a gift without wrapping it, or telling a joke by doing the punchline first, or why not reveal the trick and then perform the trick, or why not tell your son that that's not really Santa Claus, it's me in a costume. True. I mean, there, there, are, there are a lot of uh, possible on that, but um, like I said, we... How many tricks have you talked to other people and go, oh, he did this. He made my dollar bill appear in my wallet or whatever. And you know, that was not the way the magician did it in any way, but oh, that's totally. the way they remember it. Totally. Kind of I mean, there's sure. people that will explain how something works and it could work that way, but that's not the way it right. worked. But my point is you're really taking the magic out of the magic and it, it's really underwhelming when you know how it works. <laughs> it un is, but again, unimpressive. that's such a few... That's a, such a few, that's such a minority of, I mean, I, I do, I've been doing this all my life and I've never had anybody go, yes, that's exactly how you did it because I saw it on YouTube, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so I, I don't know, it's just different views and I, do I like it? Yes and no, but I got to say yes, because I, again, with the Mass Magician on channel 32, my shows increased. See, I uh, wish your shows would have increased because you were a good, good marketer and you're a good performer. Well, that, well that's true, but people, people wanted to see magic more. It, you have to get them to want to see magic. I mean, yes, my marketing is excellent. I have a marketing director that does everything online mm -hmm. for me, so that is excellent. But even so, you got to want to have people see the magic. Well, and America's they, Got Talent and Shin Lim, they made it popular. Without they made it real. very popular again, yeah. You know, that's one thing. A lot, there's not a lot of magic on TV right now. Uh, as far as getting it, uh, getting a pop. I never got a lot of uh, pops when Chris Angel was on TV. Uh, David you know, Lane made it popular. Jim Mark Lynn, Wilson made it popular. Talk about that, but you know, I'm talking about in the in the general public. Nobody, the very few people talk about them. As great as they are, and they are on TV. It's not Copperfield. It's not Henning. You know, Copperfield when there was specials on, there was pop. You know, a lot of people wanted to see magic again. Uh, However, now, because there isn't a copper field on TV, you know, it, it's not as much in the, in the conscious of lay people. Yeah, there will be one coming up, I'm sure. Um, I hope. I hope kind of like, I a, hope. remember the Johnny Carson days, what if he would have had the person on and then he, after the show, revealed how they did it? It would kind of just it would ruin it, in my opinion. Oh, yeah, absolutely, it would. <laughs> so I don't like the masked magician. I think he should quit doing it. I don't think Penn Gillette should be doing it, you should go back into juggling and stay out of the magic world <laughs> if he's gonna reveal it. I think that it's, uh, it's not very nice to entertain a little kid and then go, here's how it worked. And they go, oh, there's a string. <laughs> right, but we're not doing that. They actually have to make the effort to go look at it. We're not, we're not doing it. Kind of true. If they know we do uh, triumph, so we'll just go triumph. I've earned triumph, you know, uh, card mm -hmm. tricks. Sure. How are they gonna, if we don't say, well, this is triumph, but I've, I've earned well, here's an somehow go to YouTube and actually put the chops in to find how that trick to begin with. Here's how it happens. Someone sees Shin Lim on America's Got Talent and goes, oh my God, he's amazing. And they go onto YouTube and they search Shin Lim and they see some of his stuff. All of a sudden, Shin Lim's trick's revealed. And they see it and go, oh, oh I'm kind of curious. And it just ruins it. Oh, it does. Absolutely. But <laughs> so that's again, why I disagree with it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that's we like can agree to disagree. YouTube's and all that. I mean, when you and I grew up, what do we have to learn magic with? Books. That was it. You go to the magic store and you learn from a mentor, or you go to the yeah. library and you read, or you go when you buy it. And I, I agree with it in private, but when it's out in public forum mm -hmm. on TikTok and yeah. YouTube, I think it really ruins it. And even more and, so, uh, when we grew up, we learned it in books, and then we took our own personality from that trick in the book and put it that trick into our personality as opposed I now agree. when they watch the YouTube video of it, whether it is for private and, and they're trying to actually learn their craft, um, it, it it's just happens they take the personality of the person performing it because it's, a, it's more of a, you, you get it more of 
rather than imagining what your personality would be like for this trick, they could actually see it and go, oh, we're going to do it this way, and kind of mm -hmm. take that same personality of the teacher. As and a lot of what I'm referring to is like you got those two little Asian kids on TikTok where the guy does the trick and the other guy reaches around his shoulder and grabs it and exposes it. Oh, right. I remember, right. Yeah, that is, yeah. It yeah, just now seems that's kind good. of mean. Right. <laughs> anyway, yeah, we can just, go on. You know, it's all for publicity. You know, that's, uh, that's what it is, and that's what all these videos are, are, are with, with uh, exposing. They, they just want to try to get the publicity, good or bad. Exactly, and I think it's, uh, it's sad. Right. But uh, let's talk a little bit about you and your show. Do you, you said you do some schools. Do you do some like corporate events? I, I'm in the event business. So there's, people don't realize how many event things there are. There's fairs and festivals and city celebrations and awards banquets and right. corporate events and trade shows and product launches. And there's so much that magic can fit into. Do you have a specific that you kind of, a lane that you stay in, like trade show magicians um, that stay in that lane or? I know no, I've not really stayed in that lane because uh, I can I can pretty much perform for any group at any time uh, young kids teenagers adults corporate uh, I've been doing it for 40 years uh, so it's it's a nice variety where I'm not actually pigeonholed into one group uh, if you, if pigeonholed into corporate you know when Enron and Alison Anderson went out of business you were done I had a few people that were done you know <laughs> and I just kept going because I do school shows I do you know family parties uh, I do fairs festivals block parties I have my own show truck uh, it's a box truck. In 20 minutes, I get a full outdoor theater, full stage, full sound. I don't even need electricity. I'm generator operated. It is cool. an amazing opening of a, of a stage. I mean, it's cool to watch it open and, and unfold. So in 20 minutes, I can get a full stage. All my magic's already set up. I've got duplicates of all my show. One is in the show truck. One is in my van. Um, so I can, And then I do close-up magic. I uh, do full strolling for corporate hospitality yep. suites. Um, see, I grew up, when I grew up in Chicago. I'm from Chicago. Okay. Uh, when I was 12 years there. old, I got a job at a trick shop, Izzy Rizzy's Trick Shop on the south side of Chicago. And they owned a lounge, the biggest magic lounge in Chicago called Little Bit of Magic. It was directly across the street. And so I was 12 years old working at the trick shop. And uh, Mike Grzminski, who was the owner, and Dean Vitale, who was the owner of Izzy Rizzy's, said, Johnny, I need you to do a magic show for the kids on Saturday during the day for a uh, birthday party. I said, sure. I did that. That was my first show I ever did. He came up to me and said, you're our Saturday magician from now on. Cool. I mean, that was amazing. And so every Saturday did that. And then I don't know if you know a gentleman named Bill Malone. He's not real famous sure. in magic. I'm just sure. kidding. Uh, Bill Malone's one of the best close-up magicians in, in the world. Uh, he worked at Bill of Magic. So I became, became very good friends with him. He's about five, six years older than I am. And I, I took lessons with Bill because Bill was at a little bit of magic. And him and I were close. And, you know, I took lessons from him. So I learned my close-up, a lot of uh, – entertainment value from Bill uh, through that. When I was 13 years old, I'd be working till two in the morning doing close-up magic for the adults at this lounge. So was, my dad would pick me up after it, you know, at one, two in the morning on Fridays and Saturdays. So I've literally been working since I was 12, 13 years old performing magic. And from there, you know, just handing out cards and that, I, people kept calling me. So I was able to learn with the adults and then the kids are easy, you know. Sure. And so I can pretty much, you know, do in any, any faction. And I think the variety is what keeps you busy. It, it, you know, again, if you're pigeonholed in one area, school well, shows, I, I used to do a I lot of I went into that same thing. I bought uh, Joel Bauer's book, Hustle, Hustle. And I started doing product mm -hmm. launches and company picnics. Great book. Kind of yeah. went into all different. I didn't go into cruise ships. I thought about it, but I just didn't like the idea of being stuck on a boat, even though. Right. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm great, agree with you there. I always thought, you know, I do cruise ships. I'm gone for six months. At that time, especially because, you know, it was basically phone books, mailers, word of mouth. Uh, I'm gone for six months. I come back, I have nothing. Right. You know, so I've, I've loved Chicago. I've always stayed in Chicago. To me, Chicago is the best mecca for what I do, uh, from birthdays to communions to fairs, festivals, block parties. And I've traveled the country with fairs, to Vermont, and a lot of East Coast fairs with my show truck because they love it. You know, I could just sit, pull sure. up on their grounds, put a stage out, and I'm ready to go. So... I have traveled a lot, but Chicago is such a great mecca. I, I love performing and staying in Chicago. So with this, uh, my background in the event industry, I did that forever until my last show was March. I did an expo, a trade show for the event industry in March. And then this, this thing came in called COVID and it kind of disrupted mm -hmm. stuff. I see that you guys have got to set up. Did you migrate pretty easily into that and get, uh, you got, got to innovate, make it work. It was a definite um, shock. You know, my, I, I, in my show, uh, 
yes and no. You know, obviously I had to learn a little bit more with lighting. I, I personally, I don't think I'm perfect with lighting still. Uh, I think my sound has gotten better because I do a lot of music routines. Um, probably I'd be giving this away and other magicians will be doing it. I mean, I've seen other guys, they, they talk for 45 minutes doing magic. That's great. You know, they, you know, 20 minutes of my show is music. People sit back, listen to the music, and watch magic. I do a full dove and dog act, um, some plumes, illusions, whatever. And I think that is the key on Zoom. You do more music, and then your talking tricks aren't as, aren't as long and drawn out for people to sit in a front of a video. Um, you know, so I'll do some, you know, like Princess Card Trick is a great trick for, uh, sure. video, for Zoom because that involves everybody. But then you got to do a couple things where you, you have to open the mic to a couple people to, and actually speak with them. And then it gets a little choppy then, too. Right. Um, I have not tried anything with camera trickery or video editing. I have seen that on Zooms. And that has gone awry. <laughs> and, you know, my thing is, what you see here is what you would see if I'm at your house, your facility, doing it live. It should be. And, it's virtual. You know, so, right. And so I've seen a lot of that. So um, it wasn't a bad transition. A little bit more on technical end of it, lighting, sound, um, but coming into it. And then stretching the show out to a good 45 minutes because all my audience participation that actual volunteers is gone. Uh, right. So I had a, you know. I do a little close-up magic where I, you know, put the camera down, do some cards, do some coins, slide a hand there. Uh, so it wasn't a bad transition. Do I like it? Not really. Um, I have been one of the lucky ones. Um, I've actually, since June, my live shows have been actually still very prevalent. I, you know, I'm doing almost as many live shows. Well, I'm doing 80% live shows, 20% Zoom shows is basically, you know. But your entrepreneurial spirit shows because you kept it going rather than rolling over playing dead yeah well Never you know what there's a lot of my friends on uh, you know friends in chicago i'm good friends with and they want to perform they just you know this uh, I, I don't know if you want to call it the marketing or whatever you know i was lucky the one enough to get the calls for shows and i talked to them and they want to do shows too we can't you know and if you think about it we're actually social distance to begin with we're you know nobody sits True. closer than six seven feet from us so doing the show is not a problem um you know when i have audience participation members come up to help me i wear a mask if they want to wear a mask, that's fine, you know, but I've got my mask on. When I'm done, I give them a magic squirt. I give them hand sanitizer. So they leave with hand sanitizer. <laughs> so we're doing it as safe as possible, too. And <laughs> honestly, out of the 140 shows I've done since June, and that's a lot for this period of time for COVID, because those are live, um, I've not had one, one complaint. Everybody even says, man, you kept that safe. That was great. Everybody liked it. You know, if the audience is close together sitting down, that's their, you know, I don't, whatever they want to do. I've had audiences that are social distance in rings sitting down too. So, um, you know, people still want to do it and as well, we do it safely. And, I agree. You know, I was talking with a friend of mine in Las Vegas and he said that most of the entertainers are out driving Uber and Lyft, but the innovative mm -hmm. ones take that showroom and they turn it more into the VIP sections. And then they're doing like uh, pay-per-view stuff and broadcasting shows out. And they get revenue yep. that way. So there's I mean, always honestly, a way. The first five months of this, March through whatever, five months later, I did uh, my fiance, who's also a face painter, so she works too. So hers, all her face painting is gone. And she's my assistant in my show with the illusions and all that. Mm -hmm. uh, she also works at a uh, uh, store, Meyer. I don't know if I can say the brand name. Uh, but she got me a job there. I, it was my first job in my life was working at Meyer for, in March. I never, I've done magic all my life. And uh, so I worked there five months, and it was a great tour of duty, and I'm done. <laughs> you know, and it got me through those few months that absolutely nothing was coming in. And, uh, you know, looking back on it, maybe it would have been better off for me to take the unemployment. I don't know. You know, now I'm incorporated, so I did get the PPP loan, mm -hmm. uh, which is great. And with being incorporated, it was much easier. I just gave my pay, pay taxes to, uh, you know, the, for the PPP, and they came through right away. So it sounds, I wouldn't have gotten like... the PPP loan if I didn't take, if I did unemployment. So. Six of one, half a dozen the other. It sounds like you a... and I are similar in that realm of uh, the job thing. I never really had a job, but I did give it a shot. In fact, I'm driving for Amazon right now to just bring in some extra money over the holidays. But uh, having a job versus being a magician, you know, you do all your marketing work and all your practicing, and then you get on your stage for 20 or 45 minutes. That's when you, that's when the passion's going. And then you got to go back to work practicing and learning new things and Mm -hmm. uh, I just enjoy that more than uh, punching a clock and working for somebody else. It's just oh, it's absolutely, more it's more yeah. gratifying, you know, satisfying for yourself. So, do you primarily stay over on the east side, Chicago, 
Eastern? No, I mean, I, I, I don't. It's wherever, you know, it takes me. But for some reason, the fair, when I was doing fairs and festivals, East seemed more. Pennsylvania, Vermont, Ohio, those types of Indiana, Michigan, those seemed more the areas of the fairs, you know. Um, sure. I never really tried West. I mean, years ago in the 80s, you know, I did almost every school in Phoenix at one time. I'd drive out to Phoenix, stay out there a couple of weeks and perform at elementary schools. That was really cool because a lot of those schools, they didn't, they, they were an outdoor auditorium. It was really cool. They're, you know, I'm on a stone uh, or cement uh, stage and all the tiers of people outside sitting on cement te uh, steps watching yeah. a show, doing it outside at a school. That was really cool. So, no, I've been out west, but not as much. Uh, east seems, I don't know why, it just happened to go that way. Uh, okay. You know, I had a couple agents get me a couple shows out east, and then to make it worth it, I kind of fill in gaps a week here, week there with some fairs and festivals and uh, things like that. But uh, I just love Chicago. Like I said, it's a Mecca I could do, you know, in one day I could do a communion, a birthday party, a corporate hospitality suite, a strolling magic, and an illusion show, you know, on a Saturday. That's right. not odd. And it's all different. It keeps me, you know, would I love a theater every day, same show, 7 o'clock? Yeah, for about a month. And then I'd be like, oh. I love, oddly enough, I love the carrying in and out of equipment. Uh, I love the packing up because I'm a little OCD because I like everything going back in place. You know, sure. <laughs> um, the variety of facilities I'm in, as they say, I'm in the trenches. So when I get to a facility, I, every show's a little different. My setup will maybe, my backdrop's over here rather than here, and I have to perform here rather than behind, in front of my backdrop, or sound has to go here. So it's always a little different, and I, that's what I really enjoy is the difference of it. And, you know, a day goes, if I do three or four shows in the, on a Saturday, the day just flies. You, you got know? the consistency and the variety, the best of both worlds. So Right. Well, John, um, I don't like to do, draw these out too long because I want people to, be able to consume them all. Could you share with us how do we get a hold of you if someone happens to see this on YouTube or when it's out there? How do they get a hold of you in case they want to book you for a gig? Sure. Well, my website is JM Magic, M A G I C. Uh, my name is John Meisner, so it's JM, so I have two M's next there. Everybody goes, is that two M's? Yeah. JMMagic.com is my website. My phone is 708 425 four five five eight and i would love to speak with you i'm still old school i would rather speak with my clients and that's yeah, another reason <laughs> yeah uh so many call say i appreciate that you called you know rather than sending a cold email you know and so uh i still love talking to people uh you know and, and they get the real good feel of my of what i do and, and exactly what they need for their show oh, and, totally and agree with you that's why i like doing these shows like this there's a little human interaction and some emotion rather than this walkie talkie email or text i agree exactly <laughs> Exactly. Well, I, hope we spoke with, I know I talked a lot. I hope we spoke with what you're looking for. And, oh, you know, absolutely. So. Um, I want to keep these going. And uh, if you got some new thing coming up, maybe you're doing a tour or something, you want to announce it or whatever. I'm just trying to bring the magic back into the magic and kind of elevate it and uh, let people mm -hmm. know that uh, it's not just for kids. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. <laughs> uh, yeah. And, you know, magic and, and gig uh, entertainers are pretty lost in this COVID. Uh, nobody talks about them. It's all service industry restaurants, which definitely need to be, but we're even a run lower than that where there's never been any talk for anything for the, the gigs, you know. I see you got the Magic Lounge uh, uh, sign behind you there. That's yep. pretty cool. The Chicago Magic Lounge is open in Chicago. Sure. I have not been there as of yet, uh, but they took a lot of uh, – I own one of the Bit of Magics. I told you about a little bit of Magic that mm -hmm. I worked at. A few years later, myself and the original owner opened a, a third one, Bit of Magic, and it okay. was awesome. And so they took a lot of our ideas from that third Bit of Magic and incorporated it into the Chicago Magic Line. Yeah, we did uh, these on uh, the Mississippi River, and there's Lake Minnetonka, which is a big lake west of the Minneapolis area. And we'd do like a, a dinner and a show. We'd have an MC middle act and a headliner. And we'd do That's that awesome. on... Uh, like that's awesome there needs to be more places like that because there is i know. agree there should be more magic castles all over the world and that's some <laughs> other things that we could talk further about i'm wanting to create more of a festival kind of thing almost a fringe festival of magic so oh, there's yeah 80 percent general public and then 20 percent we magicians doing mm -hmm. lectures and stuff yeah the fringe festival in chicago is very big i mean that's a, a huge thing and they go to different restaurants and, and facilities, and you kind of walk, do a walk around, you know, a neighborhood of Chicago, and you go see this act here and that act there. And uh, it's, so it's just fringe in, in general, though. It's not magic, right? It's everything. There, okay. a, a magician friend of mine, he performs there. He does a great job there, Bill Pack. 
He does a wonderful job there. He's performed there. I think Dennis Watkins, another friend of mine, he's performed there. Uh, okay. But it's a variety. It's a more variety. It's not. I'm, the I'm looking to go right down the magic line. The variety. I think that would be thing. great. <laughs> yeah, I think that'd be great. We could we could talk about that. You know. Okay. Well, if you want to stay on, we'll have a little bit more of a chat. But I'm going to sign this one off and beam it up to the universe. If you want to hang on. All right, Brad. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate. Thank you very it. much, John. It was a lot of fun. Peace. Peace out.